Well, welcome to the CEO Hour. I'm your host, Dean Akers, bringing you top CEOs and entrepreneurs every week that share their journeys. This includes their thoughts and ideas that help their success and things, quite frankly, they may not have learned not to do again. Today, we have a super, super special guest, and I'm honored to have him as a guest today, uh, our former mayor, Dick Greco, Jr. Welcome, Dick. Oh, nice to be here, Dean. And, uh, you know, our, our entrepreneurs really, you know, you and I were talking before we went on the air about all the changes you've seen, and our entrepreneurs really never get to experience what I've experienced with you over the years of learning the histories of your journey and the things that have happened, and I, I sometimes wonder if people just take that for granted. <laughs> I, it's very different, but uh, can't help but look back, but look back is over, and borrow what's good and bring it forward that type of thing totally well on the show to help our entrepreneurs we always start the journey because this is about your journey and what you've learned and things you want to share with our listeners that have helped you so that they might get a help from it and so that journey started in september of 1933 (laughs) I was just thinking myself, it was a long journey. <laughs> that was a long journey. <laughs> it took a, lot, a long time. But well, you here. shared before we went on the air about your father, and I thought that was a great start to how, when you, you know, when when you came in this world. My mother and dad had a hardware store, well, not till after I was born, but, uh, and my dad had a, a birth defect. He had uh, one hand that was a little bit uh, shriveled and, and one leg about it in shorter had a little limp and it bothered him all of his life but uh he used to like to hunt he made a gun he could hold uh, by putting a little handle on the end of it and so forth and so on. anyway uh he was reluctant to have children this is what i was always told my mom told me that because he was afraid i would have the same birth defect that he had and uh the day i was born september 13th in 1933 14th there right there um uh, a midwife delivered me at the house, who happened to be an aunt of mine who delivered like a thousand babies back in those days. That was some pretty prevalent. And my mother described that when I started to cry my, when I was born, my dad walked from the front of the house to the back. They told him, come on in. And he was petrified almost and, and, and would not look at me. He looked at my mother and she said, you could look, he's perfect. And that night, they decided never to have any more children because I was perfect, and and I'm of course not. But the point is, they treated me that way all of my life. I, uh, all my my parents, my aunts, my uncles, my friends, neighbors, everybody loved one another and cared, and just a different uh, different way of life. But your father and mother had to be a big influence on you. Oh, no question. In that hardware store and. It was unbelievable. We had a, that business for almost 50 years. And a lot of the people in Ybor City would come in and they needed to buy something for their house. It cost $50, but it didn't have it. And they would. I watched all those years. People would come in and, can we pay you $5 on Saturday and that type of thing. And They'd line up on Saturday. People would come in there and bring whatever was growing in the yard, my collard greens or this or that or and it looked like a grocery store happened to, by the end of the day. And my mother would write in a ledger. And to my knowledge, every single person paid. And when they made enough money, 25, 30, 40 years later, and their kids became doctors, lawyers, that type of thing, they moved to Davis Island and places they never dreamed they would be. They came to the day they died to that hardware store out of loyalty and love for one another. That's what I saw all of my life. It was incredible, and when I ran for office, all that, all those people were there, and we can talk about that later too. But um, it was just a different world. So, how was that journey going in school and growing up in that era, or in that in that area uh, back in the '30s and '40s? It was just much different. We played in the street, played football in the street on Chatillon Avenue and in Seminole Heights, and. Uh, Walked to school. No one had a key to the car if you had a car back then. I mean, you didn't like it. I could have left my wallet in the front yard. I don't think anybody would ever take it in on Chatillon Avenue. You know what's funny is I could drive down that street today and practically name, as old as I am, every person that lived there because they had a part in my life. 
the lady next door, Miss McDonald, used to help me. She was a school teacher and helped me with my homework a lot of times. And the other neighbors, uh, whenever something happened, uh, they would all come together. There was love and caring. I remember one of the uh, young men was in the war then, and I was younger, and he was killed in the war. And how everybody in that street took food to them and for months. And he came over one day. I was 10 or 12 years old. And I used to like to shoot, and uh, he brought me his his son twenty two rifle and gave it to me. We still have it. Wow! And uh, things like that that you can never ever forget. Uh, and uh, Giddens Park was across the street, and so forth. And I went to Seminole School and then Memorial and Hillsboro, and I think there were three high schools. How many were in your graduating class? Oh gosh, I don't even remember four or five hundred, I suppose. It's it was still pretty large. Yeah, oh yeah, that was, there was only three schools. Right. Of course, it was it was very different. The teachers all knew you personally, and Fred Moran for office. A lot of them came to the hardware store and brought checks for ten dollars and stuff like that. It was a a huge family, is what it was like everywhere you went. Do you think Do you think that had a lot to do with the size back then, or just the time of era? No, it was just the, it was the way things were, especially. Eborn City was made up of uh, so many immigrants from Spain, Italy, and all over, many blacks. It was all one big family. We, that's what we saw from the day we were born, and that's what we loved and cared for and cared for each other. It was um, just a different different time. Yeah, you when you grew up, to your point, a lot of people don't realize how diverse Tampa was, especially in that area. Oh, wow, yeah. But we didn't realize it diverse. That's what it was, you know. Yeah, that's what we grew up seeing. Along. It was uh, everybody was treated the same. It was a wonderful, wonderful experience, and uh, much of that still exists in those places today. I, I spoke Spanish and Italian when I was a child, and when I got to be oh, 14, 15, 16 years old, I felt a little funny about it because not everybody did, and uh, now I wish you know now. I, Learned a few words in seven or eight other languages just to be able to say hello, goodbye, and people. I love to do that. It means something. But uh, it was it was uh, so different. So you you're in high school. Did you do anything in high school that was? Did you do sports or anything that helped? I played uh, tennis on the tennis team, and I went out for football in junior high and played a little bit of that and a little bit of basketball. But when I was Fourteen years old, I um, I used to like to shoot. I had a BB gun, and I always, you know, would shoot the BB gun in the yard, one thing and another. And I got to where I could throw pennies up and shoot it with a BB gun. Really? Oh yeah. And uh, that's not that hard to do. You got to just learn how to throw the penny. But anyway, uh, I remember when I was fourteen, somebody asked me to go to the gun club with them, and that used to be out where the airport is now, Cigar City Gun Club, and. Uh, I shot skeet for the first time when I was 14, and and I learned a lot from that sport. But anyway, I remember Nick Jarossi was out there who owned a produce business, and uh, he saw me shoot, and the next day he showed up at my dad's hardware store. He said, I can teach your son to be a great shot. He said, I've never seen anybody 14 shoot like he does. So my family thought, oh, that would be great. We sold shotgun shells and shotguns and that kind of thing. Next thing I know, he was telling my dad what type of gun to buy, one thing or another, and uh, start going to the gun club. And he got behind me and told me exactly what to do, how to hold a gun, when to do this, when to do that. And pretty soon I broke 25 straight. And uh, wasn't long after that, I broke 100 straight without okay. missing. And uh, with that, I started... Shooting as a sub-junior, they called it, when they had meets all over the country and became a junior when I was 16, junior shooter. And uh, well, I shot in Jacksonville and all over Tampa and all over Florida and in South Carolina. I went to a shoot in uh, Connecticut. That was the second largest in the country. That was an interesting part of my life. I, I tied with a girl when I was 15 years old in Connecticut. That well, second that, one. That, that had to be, I mean, back in that day, to, to, to pick up that sport had to be pretty unique. 
well, for a young group, there were quite a few around the country, but it was, uh, I remember tying that girl and, and uh, we had a, a shoot off and she won. And uh, there were very few women that shot. I thought, oh my goodness. And I remember the first thing my mother said when we got in the car that day, she said, uh, you did something that was even better than winning today. I said, what do you mean? She said, you went up and hugged that girl and congratulated her, didn't you? I said, yeah. She said, you can't always win in life. And I, I never forgot that. I tell and, you what, uh, I, I, that's a big message. It was. I, I went on to win the national high overall championship in Texas. So I won the national championship. So for those three or four years when other people were playing football and that kind of stuff, I was shooting skeet all the time. Well, when we come back into segment two, we're going to learn more about the skeeting, but uh, skeet shooting. But what an epic time to have had first experiences with a young lady that beat you in sports and stuff. But we will be back into segment two with Mayor Dick Greco. One. Well, welcome back to segment two of the CEO Hour. Again, I'm your host, Dean Akers, bringing you top CS and entrepreneurs every week that share their journey. And that includes their thoughts and ideas that helped them their success and things they maybe wish they wouldn't do again. When we went into the break, uh, Mayor Dick Greco was sharing his uh, early childhood growing up in the Ybor City area, but really his breakout moment was uh, with a shotgun, wasn't it? But shooting pennies (laughs) with a BB gun. All I can think about when I hear shooting something with a BB gun or a penny is that movie, It's a Wonderful Life. (laughs) Remember that where he got a BB gun or whatever? But at any rate, so... Now you've 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 gone to you're you're fast tracking on this skeet shoot deal, aren't you? Oh, that that meant a lot in my life. Winning and losing, uh, you learn to do that and learn to do your best, and uh, you can't always win, and you try to do that as gracefully as when you lose. And uh, I went from one skeet shoot to another, and sometimes we shoot seven eight hundred times a month, you know. And back then, you used to hold, have to hold your gun down to your waist when we first started, and it came up from one to three seconds after you said pull. So you listened for the trap to swing, and nobody wore hearing protection. And if you notice, I've got hearing aids in my ear because by the time I got to college, my hearing wasn't that great. Now the hearing aids operate off your telephone, for God's sake. I mean, things oh, like, you have one of those high-tech. Oh, oh yeah, of course, you know. <laughs> but, uh, Does it translate language, too? Because I've heard y- about Yes, it. I, I haven't learned to do that. I just got these new ones. To, anyway, but it, it's kind of strange that uh, in those days, things were, we didn't even know about things like that. And uh, that skeet shooting introduced me to a lot of people. I met so many people from all over the country. The first time I shot skeet in MacDill Air Force Base, I was guest of General Tibbetts, who dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. Oh, my goodness. So the Air Force had a lot of great teams because they had to learn to lead. Now that's all mechanical. You don't need to do that anymore. And uh, so I met many, many people from from there and uh, in shooting. The other person I met was a man named Keith Neville, who had a house at um, Paso Grill Beach. And he was the governor of Nebraska. And I think he dated Buffalo Bill's daughter. Oh, but <laughs> had, I mean, we're talking back a long time. But he invited me over to his house and passed the road. Wait a minute. Our young listeners, y'all go to Google. Google <laughs> Buffalo Bill so you know who the mayor's talking about. <laughs> I never met him myself. But, <laughs> but he was, Keith in the Bill was a great guy. And he owned the house right at the end of where you park at Paso Grill the Beach. It was torn down a few years ago. And he would invite me over. every. He stayed for the entire summer. I had a boat there and we fished together for years and years till he passed away. And I missed so many people shooting skeet that uh, from all over the state and all over the United States. And uh, it meant a lot to me. And and I uh, still do a little bit of it, but not, not very much anymore. But uh, winning and losing is, is something that we do about everything in life. And I think that helped me a lot. And how you go about it, just do your best and... Uh, you know, politics uh, today has changed. My gosh, we'll talk about that later, but that could take forever from where we started. Well, you, you so you're, you're, you're shooting competitive skeet. Did you do competitive skeet while you were going to the University of Tampa? A uh, little bit. Not, not too much by the time I got there because I went to the University of Florida my first year. And then we were so, so into seeing the same people and buying clothes at the same place. <laughs> I remember 
when I went to the University of Florida for my first year, uh, time came to get a haircut. I had never gotten a haircut any place but one place in my life. <laughs> and that was the bar burger that was across the street from our hardware store, Johnny. Well, I drove home. And every time I needed a haircut, I drove back to Tampa. And that's the way we were. We were all dedicated to people and families and that we've known all of our lives. And uh, anyway, I came back and went to Tampa U, thank goodness. That's come a long, long way from when I went there. I that's was, been amazing, hasn't oh it? Oh, my gosh. Uh, Dr. He's Dr. Done, a great, is, uh, done a great job. We were together, together this weekend, and I'm telling you, they they used to put a log in the fire in the wintertime there, so, you know, you'd fall asleep in class. It was so comfortable. <laughs> now the place is unreal. They got a waiting list a mile long to get in. We were happy back, back when I got to be mayor. One of the things we did that really worked out fine was, you remember the fairgrounds was right oh, yeah. next to it. Well, Tampa, you own all the land on the other side of uh, Cass Street, where the Julian Lane Park is now, and some of those Phillips Field used to be there. Well, we traded that property so they could have a contiguous cam- campus, which worked out to be wonderful. Look at Tampa, you what it's done. Oh my God! And and it's all contiguous. They have all that the track there, and it's unbelievable. We've come a long way. I can remember growing up going to the fair there when it was there. So so now you get out of college you uh what got you interested at such a young age in politics well the hardware store politics was different when i was a kid you, you met all the candidates just about especially if you had a store like my dad did and a couple of my cousins were on the school board greco school named after one of them and every candidate used to come in that hardware store and i remember my dad taking one of the governors or some back in the warehouse and let them sit on a nail keg while they talked. And that became a kind of a, oh, that was good luck. The guy came back afterwards and tell everybody about the name keg, nail keg, which we lost, unfortunately, a few years later. But uh, it was, uh, I met all the governor candidates. I met every city council person they were in, every mayor. They would all come to the hardware store to solicit help and votes, put up a sign, that type of thing. My dad was on the Board of Adjustment, which was a um, zoning board. Uh, my uncle was on several boards. Uh, so I was around the politics. I saw it all of my life, and people were very into that in those days. And uh, I remember telling my dad several times, why don't you run for public office? And he said, maybe you should consider it one day. He said, I don't have the education that I think I need to do that. And I never forgot that because my dad didn't finish high school. My mother did, but my father did not. But he was smart. Well, he was, and he was a good person. And uh, I learned so much from them. It's not even funny. But anyway, uh, I was 29, and there was a council race that looked like it was going to be open. And and I got to thinking about it, and there weren't many people around that young in those days that did it. And. I talked to the family about it. Fine, you could do it. That'd be wonderful and so forth. And, so on. and I uh, I gave it a lot of thought. I uh, I made up my mind I would never ask anybody for money. And they said, you're crazy. There's nothing. Uh, I'm sorry. That's, I don't feel comfortable doing that. And I'm never going to criticize anybody who runs in the race with me. And anyway, we got started and... There was Dr. Flynn and Dr. Hodes, a bunch of people, and seven or eight guys my age, and they, they all got real interested, and people coming by the hardware store. All my teachers were coming by and giving me $5 or $10. Oh, wow. It was unreal. And uh, building signs, and just just incredible, the the people that wanted to help and came to the store to help, but I, I didn't ask for money. Uh, as we got further into race, someone else got in the race, which was a friend of mine, and and uh, their family had a lot more money, and pretty soon they put up many signs. I'll never forget this. And I went to one of my weekly meetings, and uh, Dr. Flynn said to me, listen, Tom Swift, <laughs> if you don't raise some more money, he said, there's nothing wrong with it. He says, what if you lose? Who are you going to help? 
and I had never really looked at it that way. And because losing wasn't in your mind, was it? Well, it wasn't, but I, I just I knew what I, I wasn't going to deviate from what what I decided I would do, and I prayed about it. I really did, and I opened every one of those meetings with with prayer with a a minister who lived on the same street as I did on Davis Island, Davis Island Community Church. And we drove home together. I'll never forget this. And I said, Earl, what do you think I should do? He said, go in and read the Bible. You'll probably get your answer. I said, yeah, I'll call you in 20 minutes and let you know what it said. <laughs> and I'm, I'm dying laughing in the car. This has made a big difference in my life. I walked in the house. I sat by my bed. <clears throat> and I was thinking, you know, well, what is wrong with you? There's nothing wrong with accepting money and you report it, that's it. But the Bible was sitting there, and this is a true story. I just flipped it open. And I looked down, and the first verse that I saw said, it's in the book of Proverbs, better is just a little with righteousness than great revenue without justice. And I thought, oh, my God. <laughs> and I read that over and over and over, thinking, oh, my goodness. Repeat that one more time. Better is just a little with righteousness than great revenue without justice. It's in the book of Proverbs. I went back to the meeting the next week, and I told them, we started this way, gang. This is the way we're going to win, lose, or draw. I won by, I think, one of the largest margins ever in the history of the city. And uh, never have, and I ran several times after that, never have asked for a campaign cover. Most people don't know that. Never sent a, a letter asking for money. And never criticized other people running. Uh, well, when we come, kind of a far cry from what's going on today. Oh, my gosh. I can't even imagine. As we come back into segment three, um, we're going to talk about how that nail keg and, and your philosophy. By the way, I know your philosophy, and it, it totally has worked for you, and I've been a supporter of yours for years. Again, I'm Dean Akers, your host of the CEO Hour, and uh, we're going to be right back in segment three with Mayor Dick Greco, Jr., and we'll see you in segment three. Well, welcome to segment three. Uh, this is Dean Akers, your host of the CEO Hour, again, bringing you top CEOs and entrepreneurs every week. And we welcome back uh, former Mayor Dick Greco, Jr., as he shares his journey. And um, as we went into break, we were talking about his first election into city council and the fact that he uh, he got, his, got, got a pretty good direction from the book by the bed, didn't you? <laughs> no question. And I'm sure that book's played a big part in your life even since, hasn't it? Always has, never never forgotten. So so now you win city council. You're how old? 29. 29 years old, first time in politics. How did that journey start and go? It was great. It was just a whole different time, and, you know, uh, it was wonderful. I, I, I got around all around the city, and of course, being from Seminole Heights and having a store in Ebor City, I, I knew many people. I spoke their language and all nationalities, and uh, I I would talk to them, and I, I know what they needed, and I know what different parts of town needed. And I got to see what was being done for four years on city council, which prepared me for going a little farther at a very young age. And... Uh, Gosh, the city's come so far, and it's hard to believe what we're looking at today. We'll talk about some of that later, I'm sure. But uh, politics, I, I just loved it. I just, I love people, and I would drive down the street at night, and there, I was running for council. There were people in one of those coin laundries. I'd stop and talk to them, see what they had to say in different places, and go door to door, and so many people helped, and and. Uh, I felt really obligated to the world. But you cared about them. Absolutely. I cared about Tampa. I cared about all of my friends, and and they they all responded. When you, you, you were on the uh, onset of the what I call the great boom of Tampa, and you obviously, as we talked in a few minutes, you, you were a big part of that boom uh, as a leader and, and such, but that had to be pretty epic back in that era. To, to now go around the city and see all the, the, the differences. Did you find anything that, that changed you when you were traveling around? I listened to people. I, of course, looked all of my life and uh, had a family that cared and always was involved in politics. And and uh, I just, you know, I enjoyed what I was doing. It really was fun. And uh, 
after I got elected to city council, I, I began to see things I thought were being done. Mayor Nusio is a friend of mine. He's a great person, very different world. Back then, all your friends would run departments and so forth, and I realized there was a need for more professional-type people to give us information and that type of thing. And so by the time I got elected mayor, uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I saw things very differently. And, and again, I never criticized anybody running. They were all good people, all friends. And uh, when I won at uh, 33, 34 when I took office, I realized I was the youngest mayor of a major city in the country. And it, it was just, it was great. And so many things back then needed to be done. That, uh, uh, you know. Did you have fire in your belly like you were city council? Did you like wake up one morning and say, "I've got to make a difference and well, I, I, you to go for mayor"? I knew that from when I started, and uh, remember Mayor Nusio was thinking about making Horizon Park, which is now a, a, a real beautiful park, uh, to some golf course or something. And I talked him out of that, and and, uh, and we made that into a to a park and so forth and so on. And then the stadium went across the street. We worked on that back then, and so many things which took place that first time around as mayor. My goodness, it was uh, uh, the, the golf course that in Forest Hills was sold. Babes of Harris had died. Uh, and some people bought it and were going to build housing on it, and they needed to get their zoning. And, of course, uh, we watched that very carefully and never got their zoning. So I went and met with them personally and said, why don't you sell it to the city? You can deduct it from your income tax. you probably get a good price for it, and we worked that out. A lot of things were personal like that, and that got done. We went on that, that golf course. I start realizing back then, the first time I was mayor, that that downtown is everybody's front yard. And I know a lot of people resent spending money downtown if you're not doing something in other areas, but we did something everywhere. Part of what allowed that to happen was federal funds were available, which are not today, and we're a a state, a city that gives back more than than we get. Now it's hard to get that. And I hired <clears throat> the best of people that I could find that could give us good good advice. And all of the things that you're seeing today came from people that we listened to. It wasn't my thinking to put the spokes at the airport and so forth. We didn't know what that was. But when you heard about it and put those little trams 40 years ago, uh, that made sense. And fortunately, everybody bought into listening to those that made sense. And look at today. Do you think back then, though, that, that one of your skills was being able to create consensus? Well, I like people, and I listen to all people everywhere. And I tried to listen to why they were telling me what they were telling me. And everything we did, we tried to do in, in helping the city out. And... Uh, Back in the area you see now downtown just bustling like crazy, it's, it's unreal. By buying that land all the way to North Boulevard from where your lady is located now, we did that with federal funds. A lot of brought the junior college to, to Ybor City. Downtown is surrounded by pretty good stuff, which makes a big difference. And all of Nebraska was cleaned up pretty much. The train station we bought, uh, you name it, on and on and on. And... Uh, all this is coming to being. Did you have a strong economic understanding, though? Because I hear all this all the time. But you understood that it, you could take one dollar and, because of federal funding, turn that into X dollars, right? No, no, no. Tell it. weren't for federal, we wouldn't have been able to do much of what we did. But, but a lot of people I hear criticize a lot of deals, but they never know all the facts. Oh, of course not. But I had people advising me. There were so many things that needed to be done. The, the pension funds for police and fire were down to nothing. When I got elected mayor the first time, we had racial problems all over this country. And that got solved by everybody getting together and working together. Moses White, um, Jim Hammond, on and on, you name it, Bob Gilder. Uh, we worked so hard. We hired the first black in the, in the mayor's office in the history of Tampa, the first black fireman. First black assistant city attorney in the southeastern United States, the first black to head the housing authority. All these things we did together that had to be done. And and Central Avenue was, was gone to pieces. And 
got federal funds to help do that. And Moses White came to me and said, please do something. He helped so, so much with everything we did. And listening to people who knew what they were talking about, when we did the tertiary treatment of sewage, do you think we really knew what they would know? But people that did know worked for us. Dale Twatman said, this is why you should do it. And we're, today they're talking about drinking that water, putting it back in. Right. I know that sounds awful. And I, I know the, when they first opened the, uh, the sewage plant that we cleaned up that water, I was invited to drink the first cup. I didn't show up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I wasn't, I wasn't married. That, that was, you know, it was, it was built during right after we left, and we, we got the money for it and hired the engineers. But many of those things, because we listened to the right people, and also the council and I got along fine. They could come in any time they wanted to. And anything major that was coming up, I discussed it with each of them. Never vetoed anything, never had to. We listened to people who knew what they were talking about. I hired the best of people to, to fix the police and fire pension funds. That was going crazy. So you did, you finished your first term of mayor, and then you, uh, you met uh, one of the big developers who is very important to the Tampa Bay area, but you, you met Mr. DeBartolo. Yeah, and I had, when I finished the first term, this is, I talked to a few people about maybe why don't they run the second term because I had three kids, and I think the job paid like 35000 a year. And uh, I got to wonder, how do I send my kids to school? How do I do this or that without relying on other people, which I would never do? And it was um, kind of a tough situation. And... I met Mr. DeBartolo trying to sell him Harbor Island because people told me he had a bunch of different types of businesses, including the malls. And we just hit it off right away. He was the hardest working man I've ever seen in my entire life. And I met with him two or three times, and he said, when are you going to quit that crazy job you've got and do something good? I said, oh, I'm kidding. I loved it. And about the second or third time he came down to Tampa, he said, I'm going to do a lot of stuff in Florida. I need somebody that understands this state. Come work for me. And he said, just write a contract, whatever you want. And uh, I thought, what? And anyway, several people came to see when they found out I was thinking about leaving. And Moses White that I mentioned to you came to my office. I'll never forget it when he heard about it. And he had a bag, and he it was full of money, dumped it on my desk. I said, what are you doing? He said, if you need money, he said, this is for you. I was cleaning my safe, and I had more than I needed. I said, what? And I told him, look, my dad has some money. I said, my uncle owns a bank. He said, no, I'm giving it to you. I said, no, Moses, I, I love you. He said, remember, you know, you've got a lot of friends that will swim with you. I'll drown with you. I'll never forget that. And it, I told him to take his money, put it back, and so forth, which he did. But I felt if I didn't leave, I was letting my family down and my kids. So it was a hard thing to do. But I left and went with the Bartolo for 20 years. When we come back into segment four, we're going to talk about that part of the journey and finishing up in your last term of mayor. So again, this is Dean Akers, the host of the CEO Hour. Today we have uh, former Mayor Dick Greco, Jr., and we'll be right back with segment four. Well, welcome back to segment four. I'm your host, Dean Akers of the CEO Hour, again bringing you top CEOs and entrepreneurs every week that share their journey. Includes their thoughts and ideas that's helped their success and things they've learned not to do again. Today we have former Mayor Dick Greco Jr. And the first three segments have been epic. I mean, what a story of a man that's really been anchoring the uh, city of Tampa growth, has seen it from its infancy to what it's today, to what it is today. And um, and and now he starts his journey with uh, Mr. DeBartolo uh, in developing the state of Florida. Well, actually, we, we built mall after mall in Florida, which uh, I dealt with so many of the governments and never got anything turned down. And I worked on several others around the United States. And then they bought the the football team, the 49ers, and I got involved in that with them. And he was the hardest working man I've ever met in my entire life. Wow. Never seen anything like it. Never took a vacation, never went to Europe, never did any of those things. Never went fishing, never went swimming. 
when Eddie won the fifth Super Bowl, he took the whole team to Hawaii, and the father wasn't going to go. He was in Youngstown, Ohio, and I said, are you kidding? I said, your son just did something really great. I said, I think you should be there. He said, all right, like we sent him to hell or something. And I'll never forget, he showed up. I was sitting with Coach Walsh and Joan Montana, a bunch of them by the pool in Hawaii. He said, well, I'm here, and he's in his three-piece suit. That night they gave him a bathing suit on stage, the team did, because he had never been swimming. The next morning he was gone at 7 o'clock. Work hard. I mean, he had, he had a hernia operation once, and, and I heard about it, so I called and his secretary. I said, how's he doing? He said, well, he's here the next day. I said, he's there? So let me talk to him. I said, boss, doesn't that hurt? He said, it hurts worse than anything I've ever done in my life. I said, what are you doing at work? He said, we didn't hurt wherever I was. <laughs> I said, okay. Uh, and I never forgot that. I took him to that's the way, but I got it. That is epic. But that's the way he was. I took him to the zoo when he was 80 years old with the two grandkids, a couple of them, one of them that owns the 49ers today. And we, we got to the first thing there, and there was a bunch of orangutans running around. And he's looking, and he says, look at those bears. I said, what? I didn't say anything. That week, uh, I spoke at the employee banquet up in uh, – I said, our boss is a multimillionaire, and he doesn't know a bear from a baboon. <laughs> and he said, why didn't you tell me later anyway? A great man who did a lot of wonderful, wonderful stuff. That had to be an epic part of your journey. So now you come back, and, and you decide you want to join the, the politics again and do your final stint at mayor of the city of Tampa. Yes. How was that? That was 20 years later. I just thought it was a wonderful thing to be able to do. He had passed away, and... Uh, I'd been to them 20 years and had a little, little bit of a retirement and, for them, and I thought this would be a great time to come back, and it was it was tremendous. I really enjoyed it. We got to build a, a lot of things in. You know, the, we needed a hotel. We had a convention center. The uh, the Marriott, I got Lou Placencia, who's a friend of mine, that deals with all the hotels, brought the Marriott people. I said, what would it take for you to build a hotel? Well, you'd have to remit some taxes. Well, we weren't making money at the convention center. We couldn't hold anything big. And uh, the uh, lobby of that hotel is, is an art gallery. They don't pay taxes. They pay all kinds of taxes about that one. And with that came along a resurgence of all that area. We bought Kuton Chobi Park for less than they paid because we made friends with the people who owned it. He still comes to visit. We bought where Mirabella used to have his fish right. market. We bought the piece where the uh, Mount McDill Park is. And when I came back last time, I realized that Curtis Hickson Park did not belong to us. It was at least the railroad. We bought that last time we were there. And uh, downtown is starting to really go, as you can see it now. And thank goodness for a guy like Bennett. He's done a tremendous job. We tried to find that flower plant that he bought, but couldn't do it at the time. I had talked the Indians into putting a their their reservation downtown and got the Washington to agree with it, but nobody wanted to do it, Cameron. Boy, that place is drawing some people. Oh, my God. A lot more than Bush Gardens. And look at it out there now. And we could have made a little more money off that. But be that as it may, everything is going very, very well now. Well, you did uh, the property up on the north side of the river up by Seminole Heights that you anchored the whole downtown. Well, we did. Right? We did a lot of that in Seminole Heights, too, with federal funds. All the, all that at uh, Nebraska, and all that area, built a bunch of new housing there, did a bunch of that at 22nd and Lake. Again, federal funds were available, and, and we were very friendly with those people all the time, as much as we could be. Uh, well, your 22nd and Lake redefined that whole area. Yeah, that did a lot for right there. Uh, and 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 there's a lot more than needs to be done, but it's coming along. And again, it's, it's a little more difficult today for a lot of them because the federal funds are not available to the extent they were there. We got millions in federal dollars, and we had people working that night and day. I mean, just unbelievable. And we treated them nicely. They came down, and every time they had some money, they called you want some money. Oh well, I don't know. And we had we had fun with with them. Well, you had a you had an energized uh, administration and. And, uh, and it sh and it certainly showed with what's happened with the city of Tampa. Well, it's going to continue to grow too. This uh, a lot of a lot of what's going on is God-given attributes of where we live and what we've got here. The look of walking outside today. I mean, 
you lived up north, you wouldn't be doing it in shirt sleeves like we are today. No, it doesn't get much prettier than today. And, and uh, it's, it's, just, uh, it's just amazing what's happening. So for our listeners, Dick, uh, as we get closer to the end of the final segment, what are some things that you would want the folks that listen, these young entrepreneurs, these people that, quite frankly, I'm really proud of. They, a lot of them here in the Tampa Bay area are energized by what you've already done and want to carry it on. What would message would you want to leave with them today that you've learned that you, you want them to take away? Get involved. Get involved in the civic group. Always vote. I want to, I want to tell you this. When I ran for mayor the first time, 60,000 people voted. Uh, the first time around this last mayor's race, about 40-some thousand, and it went more than that the second time. But still, 60,000 way back then, when you had one day to vote, now you can vote by mail and do all those things. Get involved in civic clubs. Make sure you vote. When my mother was 97, she, she asked me to bring her ballot to assisted living. She said, please bring my ballot. And I'll never forget helping her fill it out. When she was finished, she said, thank you. I've never not voted from the day I registered. I wanted to die being able to say that. But see, to those people in America, they saw the change it made in their life and the life of others and their children. Today, it's moving very fast and so forth and so on. And and I'm glad there are young people who do understand. But there are many that don't. Many that don't bother to vote. Many, all kinds of people. And they fluff it off by saying, oh, they're all the same, so what? I can't tell you how many people say, I wouldn't be in politics for anything in the world. Well, it's important. It's very. It's important that you listen. It, the city and the county and the state and the country is like planting a garden. Don't water it, don't fertilize it, it dies. And, and this is a very pivotal time in, in our country. Less people belonging to civic clubs and less people going to church, doing a lot of things that, that made us better. And I, my advice would be, you know, Get as much education as you can. Stay involved in things to do with the city. And pay attention to the people. One of the things that uh, Martin Luther King said, never look down on a man unless you're picking him up. And that's true. We're all kinds of people. All of us aren't as blessed as the others. And we need to be aware of that and do the best we can to take care of not only ourselves and our families, but other people how and when we can. And to listen to people, look at them, and see what the needs are. And be involved. Uh, don't just take and give nothing back because that doesn't work. And uh, I just, I love to be in politics. I enjoyed it. The last time I ran, things have changed a lot. I still decided no, no asking, no funny money. When it got toward the end, we were doing all kinds of looking for what people had done and not done. I had a group of young people that, that did a study on everybody running, and this one did that 20 years ago, and this one did that. And I remember meeting with them one night and then saying, if we put all this out, if you could win, I said, no, we're not doing that. So, so and they the never message understood. Is- the message is, you know, get involved, do the right thing. You know what the right thing is when you ask yourself even. Yeah, this is a great, great place to live. 123 million visitors to Florida last year. Well, Dick, I want I want to thank you for the words of wisdom, and I also would <clears throat> how blessed we all are that your dad and mom had the one child with the risk of it not being normal. And in fact, it turned out the child wasn't normal; the child was far above normal. And for that, the city of Tampa, the, our listeners today, are blessed to have had you share parts of your journey with us. And again. I, I really want to appreciate you for thanking, or thank you for coming on and sharing. My your pleasure. Journey. This this child appreciates every person everywhere. I love people, and they're all important. Well, everyone. I, I can tell you this: we're 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 not going to do it today, but I'm going to do a public service announcement. Get a bunch of our people to come out and do a public service announcement with you. That's going to be get out and vote. Do I have an amen for that? Absolutely, no question. <laughs> well, we're we're definitely going to do that again. I thanking uh, the former mayor Dick Greco Jr. for uh, joining us today. Again, thank you, Dick. My pleasure, me. And thank you again to all our listeners out there. Again, I'm your host Dean Akers, bringing you top CEOs and entrepreneurs every week. And I do want to remind you that this this broadcast, if you hear it and you want your friends to hear it, it's uh, up on the Dean Akers CEO Hour uh, podcast networks, all the major podcasts. And again, thank you, Dick, for coming in. My pleasure, my friend. Thank you for my listeners, and uh, we will talk to all of you again 
next week.